Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the teaching class for Dr. Basili Karras and all of his patients. You're in this teaching class because you're scheduled for a knee replacement or a hip replacement. Dr. Karras and his team are here to help you and answer any questions that you may have regarding the surgical procedure. A lot of our patients continue to work, and because of that, we're happy to support you in your disability journey with any paperwork that needs to be completed. You can either email the forms to our office, drop them off, or fax them to us. The forms are typically completed within seven business days and then returned to you and or your employer. Your date of disability will start the first day, which is your surgical day, and it will go for a total of 90 days. So if I'm having surgery on September 1st, that will be my date of disability, and then it will end on December 1st. So we're only allowed to provide you up to 90 days off after surgery. Dr. Karras has the expectation that he's able to fix your joint, therefore enabling you to go back to doing the things that you love. This teaching class is mandatory for all of our patients, and we find that it's beneficial to get you through the surgical experience while answering your questions. Dr. Karras operates at multiple locations. If you're having surgery at the hospital, you might be at Rush Oak Park Hospital or Rush University Medical Center. If you're having surgery at an outpatient surgery center, you might be at the South Suburban Surgical Suites, which is in Munster, Indiana, or at the Rush Surgery Center. Patients that are at a hospital have the ability to go home the same day or spend the night. Some of our more medically complex patients have surgery at the hospital as there's more resources and the ability to keep you for observation. If you're having surgery at the surgery center, you will be going home the day of surgery. Some information about Dr. Karras. He did his undergrad degree at Notre Dame. He was there for four years, and then he came to medical school here at Rush. While he was at Rush, he did a lot of research with the orthopedic department regarding development of ongoing programs, and he was well known by most of the practices here. After he finished his medical school and received his Master of Science degree, he went to the residency program at Duke University Medical Center. He was there for five years where he completed his whole residency, and then he came back to Rush to do a fellowship. A fellowship is a highly specialized year of training where you subspecialize in your specialty. For him, it was hip and knee replacements. After he completed that, he went downtown Chicago to a private practice and was with them for about three years until he decided he'd like to come back to a more academic setting. And then he came on as a partner at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Throughout his initial time here at Midwest Orthopedics, he did become board certified. So he is a fellowship trained board certified orthopedic surgeon. He does a great job with his surgeries, but he also needs a really good team behind him to help support the team. Going through all the members of the team, we have clinical members and we have administrative members. Starting on the left of your screen, we have Mackenzie, who's one of our physician assistants. She came to us from a different orthopedic practice and had some years of experience and knowledge under her belt. She sees patients in clinic with Dr. Karras. She offers injections, she answers medication questions, and she also operates with Dr. Karras. Next to her is our nurse. She has multiple years of experience in orthopedics, having started working at Rush in the late 90s. She's here to help answer questions regarding medications, wound care, help with other ailments throughout the recovery process, and an overall resource to everyone. Next to her is Nate. Nate came to us fresh out of physician assistant school a little over a year ago. He's acclimated nicely to the team and has grown his strengths in the operating room, in clinic, providing patients with injections and assisting with any other clinical questions. On the other side of Dr. Karras is our administrative team. We have Carly. She does a lot of our scheduling for us and she also sends you emails, particularly regarding the Zoom class. 
Alex is also our administrative assistant. She helps you with surgical dates, preoperative appointments, general insurance questions, and anything else that you may need assistance with. On the very end, we have two members of our physical therapy team. We have Brittany, who's our physical therapist liaison, and she will schedule your outpatient physical therapy after surgery. She will also contact you prior to surgery so you're aware of the arrangements that will be made for you. And then we have Bryce. He is one of our physical therapists. He was the first physical therapist on our staff and he services the Chicagoland area within the city limits of Chicago. We do have additional physical therapists that service areas outside the city limits as well as into Northwest Indiana. Like I said earlier, he only does two types of surgeries. He does hip replacements and he does knee replacements. Within a knee replacement, you can have a partial knee replacement or a total knee replacement. That decision is based on where your arthritis is, what your physical exam is like, and ultimately what will be best for you. With the hip replacement, there's only one type of hip, but Dr. Karras can get to it through the front of the hip or through the back of the hip. Any of these surgeries can be done with computer navigation or robotic devices. Ultimately, these are tailored specifically to you, so it is personal and individualized for your outcome. When you look at a knee replacement, a traditional incision was always about 8 to 10 inches down the front of the knee. Over the years, minimally invasive surgery came about and they had a much smaller incision on the inside of the knee. Dr. Karras does a very good job between the two meaning a quadriceps sparing incision is technically challenging for the surgeon, but a traditional incision is very difficult to recover from. Dr. Karras finds that his incisions are about six inches. They're a little bit off to the side, so it's not directly on the front of your kneecap. And he was taught to respect the soft tissues as well as use further technology with the computer assistance and the robotic navigation. A hip replacement is only done one way, but the incision can be slightly to the front or slightly to the back. When we look at the hip, we access the hip from the side. Even though your hip is deep in your groin, Dr. Karras has the ability to go a little bit in the front, which is an anterior approach, or is a little bit in the back, which is a posterior approach. He will also tell you that the surgery approach is based on your age, your x-rays, your physical exam, and what will be best for you. Getting ready for surgery can always be a little bit overwhelming. This is sometimes the first surgery that you've ever had to plan for. It becomes difficult because the ball is in your court. You got to choose Dr. Karras as the surgeon, and you were allowed to pick the location that you wanted surgery at, as well as the time frame that you wanted to have surgery within. Getting ready for surgery, we always recommend that you arrange for someone to stay with you for the first couple of nights after surgery. A lot of our patients that live alone are fiercely independent, and that's a double-edged sword. We want you to be independent, but we need you to rely on assistance for after surgery. The next thing we have you do is finish all of your dental appointments or other invasive procedures at least three weeks prior to surgery. This includes any dental appointments, any colonoscopy appointments, dermatology appointments, or anything else invasive. We ask that you hold off to repeat those exams until three months after surgery. Any blood thinning medications will need to be held prior to surgery. You have to be tobacco free for surgery. This aids in the overall healing process. It's important to prepare ice packs and keep extra ice in the freezer. Even if you're using ice right now, it probably isn't helping as much as you would like it to. It's beneficial to use ice after surgery, and we'll talk about different icing options that are available for you. Like I said earlier, this teaching class is mandatory for everyone, 
and associated with the teaching class are other preoperative appointments. These would include an appointment with an internal medicine physician, any specialist appointments, such as an appointment with your cardiologist or your other specialist. It would also include if you need any additional x-rays or a CT scan. And then we always need to ensure that we have your appropriate email address on file as well as your pharmacy information to ensure that things get delivered to you in your pharmacy in a timely manner. There are different icing options that are available to you. Dr. Karras prefers gel packs. He feels like they're the most economical and the easiest to use. If you choose to purchase gel packs through us at Midwest Orthopedics, it would be a package of four gel packs with a fabric sleeve. So you could keep two gel packs on you and two gel packs in the freezer at any given time. There are also options for ice machines. As nice as the ice machines are, they can become a little bit bulky because you need to fill them with a combination of ice and water multiple times a day. Any of these icing options are for sale in our store on the first floor of the building. And if you have additional questions about these things, feel free to contact them directly at 312-432-248. Along with the icing options, we've put together a bag that would benefit you getting ready for surgery and in the immediate recovery process. If you choose to purchase this bag, it has everything that you might need getting ready for surgery and helping in your recovery. We provide you with a bottle of Gatorade. We give you ABD pads, which are gauze dressings. We give you TED hose, which are compression stockings, Hibiclens, which you'll have to use leading up to surgery. We include the gel ice packs, and we also include a medication organizer. Again, this is something that can be purchased in the same store where you can get questions about icing answered. These things are nice to get together at once, so you don't need to go to multiple locations and piecemeal these things together. There's also a pre-covery option for some of our patients. A lot of the joint replacement surgeons use this protein packed shake that starts two weeks before surgery and goes into two weeks throughout the recovery. This is something that is an option, although it can be quite costly. Again, if you'd like to discuss the benefits of using this, you can contact the store and the athletic trainers on staff can assist you and answer any questions on the benefits of using this surrounding surgery itself. Now medications do need to be stopped leading up to surgery and these include things that thin your blood. Some of the medications you do not realize thin your blood. So a week before surgery, we ask that you stop any blood thinners, any anti-inflammatories, which unfortunately are your arthritis medications, your vitamins and herbal supplements, and aspirin. If you're on a prescription strength blood thinner, talk to your cardiologist or the prescribing physician about the guidelines of stopping those. Some of them only need to be stopped three to four days in advance. Anything else does need to be stopped seven days prior to surgery. It is safe to take Tylenol up until the day of surgery. It does not control your pain very well, but it is something to help. Now, any regular medications that you may be on, we want you to continue to take those. Ask the medical doctor that you're seeing if these medications should be taken the morning of surgery or if you should hold those that day. The medications that are typically in question are blood pressure medications, specifically water pills, or diabetic medications. If you're diabetic, your specialist will talk to you about changing your insulin dose or your oral management prior to surgery, as we do not want your blood sugar too low the day of surgery. COVID-19 is requested if you are not fully vaccinated. 
Fully vaccinated status to the hospital means that you've had two vaccines at least 14 days prior to surgery. If you've elected to not be vaccinated, you will need to have a COVID-19 test within three days of your surgery. This can be an at-home test or results from a local Walgreens or a CVS. If you have a copy of your COVID card, please send it to our office so we can update your chart with it. Another thing that our office has done to help prepare you for surgery is that we've signed you up for a text messaging service called Streamed. This is something that helps you get ready for surgery and carries you through the first four to six weeks after surgery. We have already enrolled you in this program if at any time you'd like to stop receiving these text messages, you may respond to any of them with the word finish. It will also respond to the word quit or stop or end. This is not an interactive texting service. This is something that will send you reminders about getting ready for surgery and then will help guide you through the recovery process as you're healing and wondering if things are considered normal. Like we talked about earlier, your surgical location is dependent on your age, your discharge status, and sometimes your insurance. The day of surgery, you need to go to the location that you're having surgery at. If you're going to Rush Oak Park Hospital, you would check in there at the hospital. If you're coming to the main medical center, you would check in at the main medical center. To give you a little bit of an idea of where you will be going, this is what the front of Rush Oak Park Hospital looks like. It's off of the 290 Expressway and Harlem Avenue. They have a parking lot in the front of the building, a parking lot on the side of the medical office building, and a complimentary parking structure in the back of the building. They also have complimentary valet that you can use. This is the main medical center and the building that you need to come to. This building is called the Tower, and it's on the corner of Ashland and Harrison. They have valet parking in the front of the building, and there's also a large parking structure that you can use if you'd like. For the day of surgery, your parking will be validated by the surgical waiting lounge. The Rush Surgery Center is also affiliated with the main medical center. This is in what we call the professional office building, they also have valet parking as well as attached to the parking structure that you can use should you desire. And the South Suburban Surgical Suites is a freestanding clinic. This is near the Midwest Orthopedics office building off of Calumet Avenue, but it is not in that building. This is a freestanding building behind the Meatheads restaurant. No matter where you're having surgery, the place of your surgery will contact you the day prior. They usually call you in the afternoon between the hours of 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. They will verify where you're going for surgery, the address, the parking options, and they will also review what you should bring with you when you come to the hospital. When you come to the hospital, we don't want you bringing much of anything. You have to have your insurance card and your photo ID available. Our office takes care of the pre-registration process and ensures that everything is certified through your insurance company. We ask that you wear comfortable clothes and a good pair of shoes. The shoes you're probably wearing already are sensible and physical therapy requests that you have a good pair of shoes that hugs your heel and it has a good non-skid sole on the bottom. If you have crutches or a cane or a walker, bring it with you. If you do not have access to anything like that, the hospital and discharge facility will give it to you prior to going home. This will be sent through your insurance and they can provide you one assistive device. 
A lot of times patients go home with a walker to start. It offers a little bit more stability, but some patients are able to go home with a cane or crutches. Please leave all of your valuables at home. You cannot have anything metal on your body at the time of surgery, and you cannot have any jewelry on. Do not wear things to the hospital and plan on giving them to someone else. We don't want them to get misplaced when you wake up. And if you're spending the night at the hospital, I find it's helpful for you to bring your cell phone and the charger. If you're going home the same day, I don't know that that's necessary, but some patients would prefer to bring something with them so they have it. If you purchase the Keras bag prior to surgery, you'll notice that there's a bottle of Gatorade in it. Dr. Karras and the anesthesia team ask that you drink a full bottle of Gatorade two hours prior to your arrival time. Up until two hours before your arrival time, you can drink Gatorade or water. You may not have food after midnight, but this helps you stay hydrated and distributes the appropriate electrolytes in your body. I know a lot of patients are not fans of Gatorade, you can get any kind of Gatorade, meaning sugar-free, the G2, the regular, but it does need to be Gatorade for the appropriate amount of starch and electrolytes. You can drink any kind, but you cannot have purple or red colors. Any other kind is fine. And the visitor policy has been updated back and forth between multiple locations because of COVID. We are finally back at a point that one adult visitor is allowed to come with you the day of surgery. When your visitor comes with you, they will wait in a surgical waiting lounge while you go into surgery. They cannot be with you in the prep area or in the operating room. They're typical able to see you once you wake up from surgery and you're in your hospital room. Your typical time in the recovery room after surgery is about two hours. And while you are recovering, Dr. Karras will call your family member to let them know how the surgery went. When you come to your follow-up appointments at Midwest Orthopedics, one adult visitor is also allowed to accompany you to your appointment. We do request that you do not bring any children and that you do not bring more than one person. Masking guidelines are still in effect for any of your doctor's office appointments. We've gotten you ready for surgery and now it's time to talk about the surgery. We do not get into a lot of detail for you, but we do need to prepare you for what's going to be happening after surgery. When you have arthritis, the arthritis needs to be removed and replaced with a combination of metal and plastic. In order to do that surgery effectively, it will take about an hour to an hour and a half in the operating room. Dr. Karras does the entire surgery himself. He needs people to help him during the surgery, but each surgery is relatively fast. When your joint is replaced, the bad bone and any cartilage is removed and replaced with a combination of metal and plastic. Patients that have knee replacement also have a special bone cement that's in there and that adheres the metal pieces to the bone. The bone cement is a special formula that actually has antibiotics in it and the scientific name for it is called polymethylmethacrylate. Hips do not use bone cement. Hips have a bony ingrowth surface that directly grabs onto the metal implant. The metal pieces are in place, and then there's a plastic piece that goes in the middle that acts as your new buffering surface. The plastic piece is a medical grade plastic that should last you about 18 to 25 years. The scientific name for the plastic is called highly cross-linked, high molecular weight polyethylene. Basically, this means that a piece of plastic was taken and the particles were cross-linked, and then it was placed in an E-beam irradiator to help resist wear and tear over the years. 
When you travel after a joint replacement, you will set off the metal detectors. The easiest thing to do is to let TSA know that you have a joint replacement in place and they will put you through the full body scanner, which can pick up that joint replacement and they can visualize it. We used to give out cards for travel and people were using them dishonestly and we had to stop giving them out. And now the best way to use the travel precautions with a joint replacement is to go through the body scanner. This is a picture of one of the robotic systems. This system helps Dr. Karras measure your leg lengths, balance the soft tissues, and put the pieces in. This does a lot of data gathering at the time of surgery and for the surgery. Dr. Karras will sometimes tell you robotic surgery is a little bit more difficult than manual surgery because so much information is being given to him at once. The robot does not do the surgery it assists with the alignment and the balance. And this is what a joint replacement would look like. In the upper left-hand corner, you have a hip replacement. You can see that it's a ball and socket type system with a stem. And next to it are two types of knee replacements. On the far right is a full knee replacement. You can see that the whole area of the knee is resurfaced and next to it is a partial knee replacement. You can see just one part of the knee was resurfaced and the rest of it has good cartilage and it was left alone. This shows you a little bit better of what a knee replacement might look like. You have a full re knee replacement in the top left. It means that the whole area had arthritis and needed to be replaced. Next to it is a partial knee replacement. This particular knee replacement shows a replacement on the inside portion of the knee or the medial compartment. It can also be mimicked on the outer portion of the knee or the lateral compartment. And underneath it is also a partial knee replacement, but this is known as a patellofemoral replacement. This means that you had isolated arthritis underneath your kneecap and just that area was replaced. When we look at cartilage and cartilage loss, this picture shows you how a good cartilage looks as well as a good joint space. You can see that the areas are nice and smooth and there's areas between the two bones. When you begin the arthritis journey, you start to get cartilage loss, joint space narrowing, and bone spurs. A lot of you are experiencing these things already, and this leads to extreme pain, stiffness, difficulty navigating stairs, and problems sleeping at night. When Dr. Karras does the surgery, he will line up your leg from the top of your hip to the bottom of your ankle. And the purpose of this is to restore the joint space and the mechanical access of your body. You can see on here that the line is not lined up within the center of the knee, and that's because the knee has arthritis and it has bowed out. Prior to surgery, these x-rays are measured to ensure the appropriate angle of the leg to make it straight from top to bottom. This is ultimately what a knee replacement looks like on the inside. You can see that the areas of the bone were prepared and all of the arthritis and bone spurs were removed. And inside is a combination of metal and plastic. These pieces go in individually and then they're put together on the inside of your body. The benefit of this is if a piece wears out down the road, we can just replace that one piece. We don't need to disrupt the metal pieces if they're functioning well and not having any difficulty. A knee replacement system follows the same guidelines that a hip one. So a hip replacement, again, you can see there's a difference between cartilage and cartilage loss. 
Because a hip replacement system is a combination of a ball and socket type system, we still measure arthritis looking at your femoral head and your femur or your thigh bone. You can see that the destroyed cartilage becomes bony patches. You develop bone spurs. And this is what provides horrible groin pain and it makes difficulty putting on socks and shoes. You have a problem laying flat in bed because your hip hurts so badly and you're usually much more comfortable in a recliner with your legs flexed. Just like with the knee, different measurements are made when the hip replacement is performed. There's different landmarks that Dr. Karras can measure off of to ensure that you have a good leg length and that you're equal to your other side. He can also template and make sure the correct size is available for your hip. Since these pieces are fit on the inside, they're put in as a press fit and your body will actually grow into the metal surfaces. And this is what a hip replacement would look like. Just like with the knee, a hip replacement is modular and the pieces go in differently and separately. So if something wears out over time, we can just replace that piece that wore out. As good as the surgery is, you will have some post-operative care and some dressing changes that you need to use. And we'll teach you how to do that before you leave the hospital. Wound care is very basic. Dr. Karras allows you to take a shower right after surgery. You can let soap and water run over the incision area and then pat it dry. You cannot get into standing water, such as bathtubs or swimming pools, for at least six weeks after surgery. Once you're finished showering and your incision is padded dry, you can cover the area with a gauze bandage. If you have furry friends at home, do not let them rub up against your incision. You need to keep some sort of a barrier between your skin and an outside source. A lot of that depends on bacteria and us allowing your skin to heal appropriately. When the skin incision is closed, there's multiple layers of suture from the inside out. On the top, you will have either a row of staples or you will have a pronao dressing. It depends on your risk, your age, and the integrity of your skin. Patients that have staples have a special dressing over the top called a wound vac. This looks like a purple sponge, and this is used for our higher risk patients, such as those that have an elevated body mass index, those that have diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, or recent smoking cessation. All of those things can lead to dangers with wound healing, and we want to give your body the best chance to heal. A perneo dressing means there's still stitches underneath the skin, but on the top, it looks like there's a piece of flexible fiberglass, and then it's covered with crazy glue, which is a medical grade. No matter what you have on your skin, the dressings stay intact until your first follow-up visit, which is usually three to four weeks after surgery. It's at that time that your staples will be removed and the perineal dressing will come off. Skin closure can be done in multiple ways. We used to use external sutures on the skin, but we found that this very little skin edges were becoming strangulated and it was giving problems with wound healing. Medical tape we found was not strong enough to hold a joint replacement incision together. So we've gotten down to using either staples or glue. Even though glue may not sound like it's strong enough, there's a reinforcement fiberglass type material that's used underneath it. This is what a wound vac looks like. You can see that it's a purple sponge 
And this is something that sits on the outside of your skin. There's nothing in your skin from this, but it sits on the top and it's able to provide negative pressure to further protect your skin as it heals. Once it is on your body, it looks like this. It becomes decompressed with negative pressure and there's a tubing system that's connected to a battery pack. If you have the wound back on, you will go home with it. This is a waterproof dressing over the top. You may still take a shower with this on. The wound back itself will only stay on for seven days. When you're home and you have this battery pack with it, the wound back can be removed by either you or your physical therapist. Some patients do not want to remove it. It makes them nervous and other patients don't mind. If you do choose to remove it on your own, the whole dressing will peel off like a big piece of tape. Everything that was attached to that waterproof dressing, including the tubing system and the battery pack, will go in the garbage. You will know that this is ready to come off on day seven, partly because the battery will die and it will make a horrible beeping noise and you're also at that point very ready to get rid of your little appendage, which is the battery pack. For those of you that have a perineo and dermabond closure, this is what the dressing looks like, and then it's reinforced with medical grade crazy glue. On your skin, this is a surgeon applying the perineo dressing along with the crazy glue. And then after surgery, you'll have a gauze dressing over it for added protection. This will stay on until your first follow-up visit. It does not have the ability to fall off. If you find the edges are starting to curl up, you may trim them with a piece of si uh, with scissors. But if you do find that this falls off, it typically means that you took it off and we need to be contacted immediately in order to ensure that your skin is healing okay. After surgery, a lot of patients will have two dressings. They'll have a dressing over the incision area where the joint replacement went, and they'll also have a smaller dressing where the robotic navigation arrays went. A lot of times it is not on the side of your leg, it's on the top or the bottom of your incisional area. Once you remove the wound back dressing or to reinforce the perineo area, you can use gauze dressings. If you purchase the Keras bag from us, there's plenty of gauze dressings in there for you to use. If you'd like to purchase them on your own, you can get gauze pads, which are four by fours, or you can get abdominal pads, which are five by nine. The abdominal pads or the ABDs are nice because they're a little more cushioned and they're a little bit bigger. So they uncover the whole area and give you some extra protection throughout the healing process. A lot of patients after surgery will notice bruising and some redness. That's considered very normal. We typically don't find that you bruise right over the knee area, but we find that you bruise above it on your thigh or below it in your shin or your calf area. Because your knee is a hinge joint, you will also find that the bruising moves around. A lot of our hip replacement patients do not seem to bruise very much. They may have a little bit of bruising on the back of their leg or on the front of the thigh, but they do not tend to bruise nearly as much as a knee replacement would. Now, just as we talk about that, we do have patients that bruise this significantly, meaning they have bruising from their groin area all the way down to their calf area. This is not something to be worried about, although it may seem alarming to you. Any amount of bruising is very normal. 
as you can see from this picture, there's a spectrum of bruising where it can start very significantly purple and your body will absorb it or it will move around. And some patients come to me and say, I thought I was going to bruise. I mentally prepared myself for that. And then I found I did not. This is where your body takes over and you are predisposed to your bruising patterns from the day you were born. If you know you bruise pretty easily, mentally prepare yourself to have a little bit more bruising. Now the surgery works very well, but in order to do the surgery, we need to ensure we have a good anesthesia process. Dr. Karras has handpicked the anesthesia team that works with us. And just like he is subspecialized in joint replacements, the anesthesia team is subspecialized in regional anesthesia. You will have an anesthesiologist that is used to doing joint replacements on a regular basis. This is a completely separate team that you would have for open heart surgery or brain surgery. These doctors are very well versed in joint replacements on a regular basis. When you're discharged from the hospital, you'll be sent home with some information about anesthesia and what to expect after the procedure. And while you're with the anesthesia team, they will talk to you about these things before you go into the operating room. Our anesthesia of choice is called a combined spinal epidural anesthesia. The benefit of this is it provides good pain control while you're in the operating room. It will make you numb from the waist down and allow Dr. Karras and the surgical team to move your leg however he needs to. On top of that, you'll have an IV in your hand or your arm and it will give you twilight sedation. We like to use this over general anesthesia because general anesthesia can have risks associated with it, such as increased nausea and vomiting, forgetfulness after surgery, a more difficult time waking up. So no matter what, you will be talked to about what is best for you. And ultimately, you and the anesthesia team will discuss the next steps. This is what an epidural catheter would look like. It's typically put in your lower back around your belt line and you're sitting up on the side of the bed as that's performed. Prior to this occurring, the anesthesiologist will have already placed an IV and they will be giving you some medication to make you relax. For some patients, the epidural placement is the most nerve wracking part of the surgery itself. A lot of patients come to us and say, I'm ready for the surgery, but I'm very anxious about the anesthesia. Speaking from personal experience, an epidural that goes in does not hurt. What hurts is the numbing medication that they give you in advance. And you still want that numbing medication. But once the epidural goes in, you will feel a lot of pressure and then you'll feel that your legs go numb and we know that the epidural is doing its job. When you wake up from anesthesia, you will probably feel groggy. Not only did we make you numb from the waist down, but we gave you medication to go to sleep. And most patients are still sleepy for about an hour after surgery. You may find that your leg feels heavy, and that's very normal after surgery. It's a combination of the anesthesia and you being numb, and Dr. Karras having replaced your joint and moving your muscles to the areas that they should be focused on. Do not anticipate you being able to lift your leg up off the bed as soon as you wake up from surgery. You might also feel cold, the operating rooms are kept pretty chilly to decrease bacteria growth and to ensure that the surgery is done in the safest manner. And at no point should you have uncontrolled pain. 
because the anesthesia starts with a spinal block and it makes you numb from the waist down, that actually transitions you into the oral pain medications. Even if you come out of the operating room and your legs are still heavy and numb, we will be giving you pain medication. So when that numbness is completely worn off, your body has medication inside to allow that smooth transition from the anesthesia to the time of going home. If at any time you feel like your pain is uncontrolled, please let your nurse know. They can assist with additional medication, repositioning, or even ice. After surgery, everyone wants to go home. There is always a benefit of sleeping in your own bed and enjoying your own environment. Everyone has the same goals upon discharge. You need to sit on the side of the bed and dangle your feet. You need to be able to get up and walk with physical therapy, including a full flight of stairs. And we need to ensure that you're safe walking up and down a hallway, toileting yourself, and to ensure that your pain is well controlled. Some patients meet these goals within hours of surgery. Other patients meet these goals by the next day. The medical team and the orthopedic team determine when you're safe for discharge. You should know about your estimated length of stay, whether you're being discharged home the day of surgery or the next day. And then once you're discharged home, a physical therapist will come to you. If you live in the Chicagoland area, a physical therapist supports that area within the city limits of Chicago. We have other physical therapists that cover the suburban areas, including into Northwest Indiana. If you live in a different state or if you live outside of our covered area, we utilize a different therapy company called Athletico. They are also licensed to see patients in their home and the benefit is somebody can come to you for the first week or two after surgery. Dr. Karras does not support inpatient rehab stays after surgery. We find it's much safer for the patient to go home to their own environment with their own bedroom and bathroom. Like we touched on physical therapy earlier, Brittany will be contacting you prior to surgery specifically to discuss your physical therapy after surgery. Patients that have a hip replacement are usually seen in their home for two to three times a week for the first two weeks. Patients that have a knee replacement are typically seen in their home two to three times a week for the first two to three weeks. Once you've met your short-term goals from the physical therapist working with you, you will be expected to go to outpatient physical therapy at a clinic that's convenient for you. Sometimes that clinic would be a Midwest Orthopedics location. Sometimes it's another big box chain that's on the corner of your street. Wherever you go, we want it to be convenient for you so you're compliant with your exercises and you're recovering appropriately. When you're with physical therapy, they will be focusing a lot on RICE. RICE is our acronym for recovery that encompasses rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Resting seems like it would be self-explanatory until you've had surgery and we're telling you not to do much. Dr. Karras would like you to rest more than not after surgery. He places an activity restriction on you of five minutes of activity an hour. He does not want you to overdo it as you can easily become the victim of your own success. The more you rest early on, the less you will swell and the better pain control you will have. Icing is very important to help with swelling and bruising. It's also used as a pain medication in conjunction with the pills that you'll be taking. Compression is important, especially if you're swelling in your lower legs. 
Some patients swell the calf area into the ankle and foot area, and the compression stockings that you'll be given can help move that fluid back up towards your lymph nodes. Your knee tends to swell because it's built a little bit like a tree trunk. Your hip does not swell as much because it's much closer to your lymph nodes in your groin. If you do find that you're having a lot of swelling, we will ask that you elevate with your toes above your nose. So if you're struggling with swelling during the day, we want you to lay in your bed and build a ramp of about seven pillows that you can put your foot on top of. The more your toes are above your nose, the more your body will reabsorb that swelling. If at any time you have swelling that's not managed by these things, if you have severe pain in your calf, please speak to your physical therapist or call us in the office so we can discuss how to better manage your swelling. For those of you having hip replacements to help with swelling, we recommend that you wear a pair of compressive shorts or a pair of men's boxer briefs. Even if you're a female, we find that purchasing a pair of snug men's boxer briefs, which is typically one size smaller than you would usually wear, can help with swelling in the hip area. As you're recovering and you're doing things that you enjoy, Dr. Karras gets great joy out of knowing that you are enjoying your joint replacement. If you'd like to share your journey with us, please send us a picture of you being active or doing the activity that you love. Some patients send us pictures of their family on a vacation. Other pictures have been able to do things that they wanna do, such as extreme sports. We had a patient recently that went skydiving. We had another patient whose family relocated to Puerto Rico and she sent us a postcard. All of those things are possible because we helped restore your quality of life with a new joint replacement. Medications are very important to take after surgery. The benefit of taking medications is that it provides good pain control and it also helps prevent certain complications. Your medications will be tailored specifically to you. We have an algorithm of medications that we use and they're tailored to different age groups, meaning patients that are 69 years old and younger receive a subset of medications. Patients that are in the age of 70 to 79 receive a separate set of medications. And patients who are 80 and above receive separate medications. The reason we do this is not only are your organs, like your kidneys and your liver, as old as you are, but they filtrate things differently. So we need to tailor these things specifically to your body. All of the medications that you need will be sent to your pharmacy after the teaching class. Your pharmacy will then work with you about picking up the medications when they are available. As part of an email that you'll receive later, you'll receive a sample of medications, what each medication is for, and how to take it. This can seem a little bit overwhelming to start. About a third of the medications are actually over the counter, but we send them to you in a prescription form in hopes that your insurance may cover it. We find that when we approach pain control from different areas, your pain is much better controlled without us giving you huge doses of narcotics. Two of the medications that will be sent to your pharmacy are for use prior to surgery. This includes a nasal ointment called mupirocin and a body wash called Hibiclense. These things are the only things you will receive that are not in pill form. All of the pills are for after surgery. The liquid and the nasal ointment are for before surgery. The nasal ointment is used as it helps decrease bacteria that's in your mucous membranes specifically MRSA. 
And the HibaCleanse is a body wash that helps eliminate skin bacteria. If you purchase the bag, you will have HibaCleanse in that bag in a wipe form. And you can use one wipe per day leading up to surgery. We cannot give you the mupirocin for your nose because that is a prescription and it needs to go through your insurance at the pharmacy. Once you start using the HibaCleanse, you need to stop using any, any lotions or creams on that surgical area. Dr. Karras and the surgical team will wash your leg for you the morning of surgery. We just need to ensure that you're helping us leading up to that point. And then medications to take after surgery are to help with the recovery process. Our narcotic of choice is called Oxy-IR. This is a quick acting, short acting narcotic and can be taken as needed. Some patients need this pretty frequently and they're taking it every four hours after surgery. Other patients come to us and say, I don't think I really need it. I'm glad I have it, but I'm doing pretty well on the other medications. The other medications that you'll be taking are scheduled for you. The nice thing about scheduling a medication is that a steady level of pain medication can stay in your system throughout the day. We give you high dose Tylenol and Tramadol that you'll be given instructions to take it three times a day. In addition to that, if you're younger than age 70, we give you a nerve medication called Neurontin. This helps target the muscles because nerves run directly through your muscles and we want to keep those things calm. We do not give it to our older patients because it can cause some confusion when it's paired with other medications. We give our patients diclofenac, which is a prescription strength anti-inflammatory, as well as a stomach protectant called Protonix. Some of you may be on a stomach protectant already, but we use the prescription strength Protonix, which is 40 milligrams, as that helps protect your stomach and decrease any incidence of heartburn or a feeling of a sour stomach. We have to give you a blood thinner, and our blood thinner of choice is aspirin. Most patients take aspirin after surgery for the first four weeks. We do give you something stronger if you've had a history of a blood clot, if you've had a history of cancer, or if you're currently on something stronger. Sometimes you'll receive a prescription for something called Eliquis, and that's taken for a month after surgery. If you're a patient and you're already taking Eliquis or Pradaxa or Plavix or Xarelto, we will place you back on that after surgery. We also give you a medication called Senecot. This is a stool softener. It's actually over the counter, but it's a combination stool softener and laxative. The importance for that is that it will help decrease constipation that could be caused by medications. Patients can get constipated after surgery due to a decrease in activity, due to medications, and due to a change in their diet. So we want to make sure that your plumbing system is still working appropriately and the Senecot will help that along. Sometimes after surgery, patients become nauseous. Nausea can occur because of the stress of surgery. It can occur because of underlying constipation. And it can also occur due to a variety of other things that your body is going through. All of you will be given a prescription for a nausea medication called Zofran. Not everyone needs this but it will be invaluable if your stomach doesn't feel good. The benefit of using this Zofran is that it's an oral disintegrating tablet, which means you can place it on your tongue or under your tongue and it will dissolve. The last thing someone wants to do if they're nauseous is have to take a pill 
with liquid because they're afraid of what their stomach might do. If you find that you're taking Zofran on a regular basis, please let us know. We want to work with you to get to the root cause of why you're nauseous. Sometimes we need to change your diet and make things a little more bland for you. There's a brat diet that encompasses bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. If you're nauseous because you're constipated, we may need to talk to you a little bit about different stool aids. There are times that we can add things in orally like Miralax or magnesium citrate, or we can go from the bottom and do a suppository or an enema. Chewing gum helps with constipation. It tricks your body into thinking there's things it needs to digest. So chewing gum does help. And if you continue to have problems with your stomach, to lighten the mood a little bit, we have the crap hotline. It means constipation relief and prevention. Basically, that's our office. Our supportive staff can help if you're having issues in this area and talk you through ways to make you feel more comfortable. There are about a million joint replacements done on an annual basis. Out of those million joint replacements, Rush is responsible for around 6,000 of them. That doesn't sound like a lot until you break it down and you realize that a high functioning orthopedic surgeon will do about a thousand surgeries a year, sometimes more. A community surgeon at your local community hospital will do about a hundred joint replacements a year. Out of the breakdown, there's about 40% hip replacements done to 60% knee replacements. And it's been like that since the 60s. The reason is, the type of joint that it is and the bearing surface that it encompasses changes the way that arthritis affects your body. If you'd like additional data on this, you can refer to www.aaos.org, which is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons website. Every surgery that a patient undergoes has risks associated with it. We do a good job eliminating and decreasing these risks, but there are certain things that we're constantly worried about. Whether you're undergoing a hip replacement or a knee replacement, we worry about blood clots, blood loss, your hip dislocating after surgery, your leg lengths feeling like they're different lengths, your hip implant loosening, or an infection. The risks are the same for a knee replacement. When we look at all of these things, blood clots are one of the major risks associated with a joint replacement. Although the risk is less than 1%, it can be devastating if you develop a clot after surgery. To help prevent the incidence of this, you will be on a blood thinner for four weeks after surgery. We have you up and moving around very quickly. We've made major advances in anesthesia techniques and surgical techniques. But if you're worried about a blood clot, you might have severe swelling and pain in the back of your calf. It would be extremely tender that you feel like you can't let your hand rub over it. Or if you develop a blood clot in your lung, it would be much more serious and present like chest pain or shortness of breath. If that's ever the case, you need to call 911 and be transported to your local emergency room. Please let us know after the fact, but do not call our office if you're having difficulty breathing or having significant chest pain. Your nerves can be damaged because of the surgery. When the surgery is done, Dr. Karras takes great care to manage the way that your nerves run from the small of your back down to your leg. A lot of patients don't realize it, but when you walk, your nerves work appropriately to bring your toes up towards your nose so you don't trip over your own foot. If a nerve gets damaged at the time of surgery, it can affect the nerve and function of your foot and your big toes. The risk is less than 1%, and 
And this is one of the reasons that every single person will be asking you to wiggle your toes and ask if you can feel them touch your foot. For those patients that are under 70 years, you will receive Neurontin, which is a nerve medication, and this just helps keep the nerve calm after surgery. But if you have nerve damage, you will have something called a foot drop, which means your foot falls to the ground and you're unable to keep it in a neutral position. This is something that we know about before you even wake up from anesthesia. This is not something that occurs once you're home. You will not find a week after surgery that you have a concern for this. This occurs at the time of surgery and then we do investigative work to find out if the nerve is just sleepy from the pain medications or if there was damage during surgery and the nerve was severed. If the nerve was severed, we would probably need to fit you for a special brace that you would wear to keep your foot in a neutral position. Your bones can break. Arthritis historically weakens the integrity of your bone. Your bones typically stay strong by you walking on them and putting weight through them. But when you have arthritis, you're not able to put the appropriate weight through it because of the pain that arthritis causes. If a bone breaks at the time of surgery, it will be fixed immediately. Dr. Karras will let you and your family member know about any kind of a weight bearing status or assistive devices that need to be used. And we're constantly evaluating you to ensure that you're not a fall risk. In the orthopedic community, if you take a fall after surgery, chances are your joint replacement will stay intact, but the bone around it will become damaged. And that would usually need surgery to repair it. If you fall after surgery and you're able to get up without any difficulty, you are fine. If you fall after surgery and you're having difficulty getting up or moving your leg or straightening your knee, you will need to let us know and come to rush for further evaluation or go to your local hospital and inform us of what happened. An infection can occur after surgery. And this circles all the way back to the beginning of the class when we discussed stopping any invasive procedures, including dental appointments, for at least three weeks before surgery, up through three months after surgery. This is a lifelong risk that you will carry with you that is around two to three percent. The reason this becomes a lifelong risk is because everything inside your body is still alive. You have blood that has natural bacteria, your bone is alive, your soft tissues are surrounding the joint replacement as well as your muscles. If you have any cause for concern about an infection after surgery, you would notice severe redness or brand new swelling around the incision area. It would translate into significant pain that you can't correlate with any physical therapy. That would also mean you would have difficulty walking and you may or not, may not have fevers. It also would show some new drainage, meaning your incision was fine and all of a sudden it had increased drainage from it that was unprompted. My typical rule of thumb is if you have one of these symptoms, let the office know and we will watch you for 24 hours. If you have two or more symptoms, we would want to see you sooner rather than later to look at your joint and talk to you, see how you're feeling. The reason this becomes so important is because if you get an infection after a joint replacement, it automatically requires another surgery. It seems aggressive, but the only way to clear out the bacteria is for Dr. Karras to clean it out himself. When you have metal and plastic in your body, because it is not alive, it doesn't have enough power to get rid of the bacteria. So Dr. Karras would take you back to the operating room, open up your incision, clean out the bacteria, replace the bearing surface that's in there, which is the plastic piece, and then close everything back up 
he would consult with the infectious disease team and they would analyze what the bacteria was. They would put a special IV in your arm called a PICC line and that would stay in for six weeks. You would then be taught how to give yourself IV antibiotics for six weeks while you're at home. This is a big deal and I wish I could say we did not see this but we do take care of a lot of people from the community that had joint replacement elsewhere, and we do need to treat them for infections. What do we do to prevent it? We do a variety of things to prevent this from even happening. The operating rooms are kept very cold, which decreases the chance of bacteria growth. We give you IV antibiotics before the surgery starts. We give you IV antibiotics while you're in the hospital. We have special laminar flow rooms that pump sterile air in on you while you're in the surgery. Because sterile air is coming into the room, you do not want to share that air with Dr. Karras or the surgical team, so they all wear body exhaust suits. And then a part of their body exhaust suits includes two pairs of gloves. They're protecting you from them as much as them from you. If you could see what air looks like, this is what an example of a laminar flow room would look like. It's a vertical system. The sterile air comes in from the ceiling directly down on you. You breathe it and then it gets re-sterilized and re-filtered and comes in from the ceiling again. Everyone that's around you is in a body exhaust suit. So this is just your air. This is what a body exhaust suit would look like. This is Nate, our physician assistant, with Caesar, our surgical assistant. And here they are doing surgery on a patient, and their body exhaust suit includes a helmet that sits on their head, and then a hood that goes over their helmet, and then a gown that meets at the neck and goes all the way down to the floor. They also have two pairs of gloves on, and they're doing the surgery in this body exhaust suit. The suit goes on before the skin incision is made, and it doesn't come off until after the skin incision is closed. The only person that will not wear this during surgery is your anesthesiologist. They are sitting by your head, and they need to be close to you for monitoring purposes. Antibiotics are taken prior to an invasive procedure once your joint replacement is three months old through the life of your joint replacement. The reason we do that is because it will protect your body from its own natural bacteria and decrease the incidence of any of that bacteria getting to your joint replacement. We look at this as a lifelong precaution and we want you to do this forever. The prescription would consist of a whopping dose of antibiotics, which is usually four pills. You take all four pills at once, one hour before your appointment. Patients that have knee replacements can experience stiffness after surgery. This is why it's so important that you do your physical therapy, 
you maintain good pain control, and you're compliant with your home exercise program. If you're having difficulty with your range of motion and you're not meeting your goals for straightening it, which is zero, and bending it, which is usually up to 120, Dr. Karras might need to talk to you about going back to the operating room for a knee manipulation. This means that he would have the anesthesia team put you to sleep for literally two minutes and he would bend and straighten your knee for you. Nobody really wants to have this done, but we do do it in situations where you're struggling with your physical therapy because we ultimately want you to have a good result. Hip replacements don't get stiff, but they can dislocate. If for some reason after surgery, you have a hip that dislocates, you will not be able to walk, you would have severe pain, and the leg that dislocated would look much shorter than your other leg. This is usually a result of trauma. This is considered an orthopedic emergency and you need to call 911 to go to your nearest emergency room. They can usually put it back in place and then discharge you and we would want to see you in the office for follow-up. To help eliminate the incidence of this, there's three things that we don't allow you to do for the first six weeks after surgery. We don't let you plant your feet and twist at the waist. We want you to draw an imaginary line down the center of your body and we don't want either leg crossing that line. And we do not let you bend more than 90 degrees at the waist when you're sitting. Now these things may sound very restrictive but when you really think about it, you aren't able to do these things with a bad hip in the first place. Your arthritis is preventing you from doing any tight leg crossing or bending over. And by maintaining this neutral position after surgery, it allows your soft tissues to heal appropriately. Now that we've just about finished the teaching class, questions are bound to come up. If you have questions about surgery, you can go on Dr. Karras's website and he has information on there for your hip replacement or your knee replacement. There's a section about frequently asked questions. You can refer to your discharge instructions that will answer a lot of questions and make sense after the surgery is over. You can respond to this email with questions or you can call the office during the week. If you have an emergent issue on the weekend, you will have access to our 24 seven cell number that you can use after surgery. This phone number is used for emergencies, such as something that cannot wait for the office to reopen on Monday. It's difficult after hours to refill prescriptions, help with appointments or answer paperwork questions, but anything else we're happy to assist with however we can. There are some additional websites that are used for a variety of information. Dr. Karras has his own website, which is karrasmd.com. We touched on the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons website, and Midwest Orthopedics also has their own website, which is rushortho.com. Again, if there's emergencies after surgery, you will have access to our cell phone, but any questions during the week, please contact the office. Your takeaway points from here are to make sure that you pick up your medications when the pharmacy lets you know they're ready. Review the email that was sent to you regarding your medications and discharge instructions. Make sure you stop your blood thinners in advance. Wash with your HIBA cleanse and start your nasal ointment five days prior to surgery. And if there's any other questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email or via phone. A lot of our patients are candidates for research studies. Because Rutch is a large academic facility and a teaching institution, we are constantly doing research in a variety of areas to make the whole surgical experience better for patients. 
If you are able and willing to participate in research and if you receive a phone call about it, we encourage you to be a participant. Dr. Karras does not know who participates in research or not because he wants to eliminate any bias. You do not get treated any differently if you participate in research or if you choose not to. There are forms that need to be signed and we will do these forms with you over the phone and assist you with them. Our office will contact you after the class is over and before your surgical date to make sure these forms are completed. You are all a great audience. Please enjoy my funny slide as we sign off. Um, best of luck with your joint replacement. We know this is your first joint replacement, but it is not ours. And we are happy to help you and take care of you to the best of our ability. Take care and best of luck.